Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, it, this is kind of an embarrassing episode. Not embarrassing for me. It's really embarrassing for Jensen Franklin. And the reason why it's embarrassing is because he didn't study. Uh, one of the things I've noticed over the years, decades now, that I've been doing Fighting for the Faith is that um, there are a handful of sermons that I have run into where the, the pastor who delivered the sermon clearly didn't do his homework. Now, I'm a pastor, and so every single week, whether I want to or not, because uh, if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble. I have to prepare. That means I have to study the text. I translate the text from the original language that I'm going to be preaching on. I check commentaries. I check what the writings of the church fathers have said regarding that passage of scripture. I even look at, you know, it, it like the sermons of the church fathers and how people have, have preached on these texts in the past and then work my sermons out accordingly. But it's a time-consuming process. But over and again, as somebody who goes through the time-consuming process of preparing sermons, occasionally I run into a sermon where it's clear that the pastor who's delivering the sermon that I'm critiquing or offering a counter argument to, they haven't done their work. And scripture legitimately warns against that, actually commands pastors to do something. In fact, why don't we do this? I'm going to whirl up the desktop and uh, we are going to go to our Bible program here. Uh, the pro Bible program, again, is Accordance. That's what I teach from. I study from Logos, by the way, and it's not Logos. It's, it, it, anybody who pronounces the software Logos as Logos knows that, tells me you don't know Greek, okay? Because Omicron is a short O, not a long O, but anyway, that's a whole other story. But here's what it says. Um, Paul, writing to young Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy, his final uh, epistle before he's going to lose his head, uh, it says, here's what he says in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, 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 and I, I like the King James here also, because it, it uh, actually gives us uh, a pretty decent translation too, because there's some challenges in how you're pulling over the Greek into the English. But listen to, to how <clears throat> the, the King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, needing not to be ashamed, right? And so it's it's like having egg on your face when a pastor decides he's going to phone in his, uh, his sermon. Uh, and uh, when he phones it in, oftentimes he's going to mess up. And so what we're going to do is we're going to listen to a portion of a sermon delivered recently by Jensen Franklin. And oh man, there is a major gaffe in here. Uh, and I and I by major I mean it's actually like groan worthy embarrassingly bad gaff, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's let's whirl up the web browser, and uh, the name of the <laughs> you know it's going to be a bad sermon based on the title. Dreamers don't forget his dreams. Okay, so we're going to look at how what he's doing. We'll examine like how he's doing what he's doing. We'll see the gaff for ourselves. We'll actually look at the text in question in context because what the, I don't like to miss a good opportunity to preach on a text that the person that's doing the bad sermon isn't going to actually preach on because they, they don't preach anyways. And then we'll, we'll kind of look at how he's using these passages, and I mean like really horribly misusing them. So... Um, <laughs> grab a vomit bag. Uh, you know, you might need it for this episode, but uh, let, let's get to it, shall we? Open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Genesis chapter 42. All right, Genesis 42, we're right in the thick of it regarding the story of Joseph, who famously had a prophetic, had two prophetic dreams, uh, which God then is fulfilling in chapter 42. But watch, watch this. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke mm -hmm. roughly to them. 
Then he said to them, where did you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Now notice, then, everybody say then. That's a manipulation technique. I'm, ser- I'm serious. When, you, when a pastor says, now everybody say this word, say the word then, that's designed to shut off all critical thinking inside of your head. It's, that's a manipulation technique. When he saw him, when he saw the brothers that had done him so wrong, when he saw the brothers that he had not seen in 20 plus years, he remembered the dreams. Right. <laughs> There's his brothers, you know, right in front of him, and it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. But there was a there were a lot of years before, you know, before those dreams were fulfilled. They were prophetic dreams that God had given to Joseph. So if you ever hear a preacher saying, "You need to dream big dreams," because Joseph, Joseph wasn't daydreaming. These were prophetic dreams given to him by God to tell him what was coming in the future. In in other words, all of the things that happened to Joseph were by the hand of God. In fact, Joseph later admits that. It says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God has worked for good, for the salvation of many people. So uh, just keep that in mind, you know, as we kind of work our way through this. But oddly enough, he's not, the gaffe isn't going to happen here in Genesis 42. But watch the point that he's now going to make, because this, it does, it does not, it is not supported by this text at all. That he had dreamed about them. What was the dream? If you read The book of Genesis in 37, 38, he dreamed of a harvest and he saw those brothers bowing down in that dream. But he saw a harvest bowing down. The harvest bent over, representing, Jesus said, the harvest is ripe, souls, the lost. See, already, (laughs) I have to ask the question, how, how many minutes did you put in preparation for this particular sermon, sir? He remembered the dream when he saw his brothers. I want to talk to you for a few moments and I'm really going to preach to dreamers and you say, I don't have one. Well, (laughs) you're going to preach to dreamers. See, see here, here's the issue. Okay. So when we talk about somebody who's had a dream, you have to make a distinction biblically because all of us dream. You know, this is a subconscious thing that happens to us while we're sleeping. And sometimes our dreams are pretty weird, right? Uh, and then you have people who are dreamers uh, because they, they, they can envision a better world and they, and they legitimately think they know a path on how to uh, get to that better world, to achieve it, to make the world a better place. So we talk about dreamers. You know, these are people who build empires or large companies that, that change the world or disrupt an industry and things, disrupt an industry, things like that. Um, and so that's one, so you, those are two types of dreamers, the everyday dreamer who dreams every day. Then you got daydreamers who Rather than working, they're 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 just thinking about the other things. You know, maybe they're daydreaming about, oh, if only I could have a date with her. Oh, it'd be so wonderful. I know what I would do. I would take her to McDonald's and I would order a, a double double quarter pounder with cheese and and you know just. You know, the daydreamer, right? You know, so hey, why, what are you doing over there? You're supposed to be working. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so that's three kinds of dreamers, right? And then you have people who have had prophetic dreams, God legitimately speaking to them through their dreams. That's the fourth kind. And Joseph was one of them. So was Joseph (laughs) of the New Testament, the man who wasn't the biological father of Jesus, but who was the legal father of Jesus. Uh, That Joseph had dreams too. Uh, Keep that in mind. And this was a prophetic dream, God delivering a message. So here you have Jensen Franklin basically saying that my sermon, my message, message today is for those of you who are dreamers. What kind? Okay, because I don't know anybody who's had prophetic dreams like Joseph. Okay, and uh, and nor are we taught that because Joseph had prophetic dreams, therefore, ergo, you can have prophetic dreams as well. 
Uh, no, that's not even the point of, of the story of Joseph. In fact, the story of Joseph is a very long type and shadow account of the life of Christ in the types and shadows regarding Joseph. In fact, the, the, the life of Jesus is so exemplified in the life of Joseph that the, the connections are really easy to make. That's the point. Joseph points us to Christ. So here you've got Jensen Franklin. I, my message today is for the dreamers out there. Thank you, Gomer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this is biblically worthless at this point. There, there's, there's nothing here. Let me back this up just a little bit and so you can hear it again. He remembered the dream when yeah. he saw his brothers. Yeah. I want to talk to you for a few moments, and I'm really going to preach to dreamers, and you say, I don't have one. Well, you're in the right place today. Oh, you're handing them out. Will you be giving them away after the service? Do you pick them up in the foyer? Where, where, where do you get your dreams from? Daniel chapter 2, there's a strange dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this is where the gaff occurs. So note, we were starting off in Genesis 42, and already you can tell he's mishandling this text. But he's going to try to draw a connection because, remember, in Genesis 42... Joseph remembered the dreams that God had given him. In Daniel chapter 2, we have Nebuchadnezzar being given a dream, a prophetic dream as well. But watch what happens here, and I'll, I'll show you how to unpack this. Babylonian king, and yeah. in the dream it was so dynamic that it would shape the entire story of human history. He, had a, he saw a statue in a dream that had a gold head. Notice the deterioration. Of, okay. of human existence. Yeah, okay. Kingdoms. It starts with gold. It has silver, brass, iron, and then ending with clay feet. I believe, I believe prophetically. And all of those different materials represented different kingdoms that have mm -hmm. come and gone in human existence. I believe we're now at the clay feet. Now, I happen to be in agreement with Jensen Franklin here. Um, that's one of the few things I agree with him about. <laughs> Very few. There may be two or three others that I accidentally agree with him on, but he's not wrong here. I, I believe that that's where we're at in human history. All of everything. By the way, I'm going to read this text out. Could collapse. And in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw a stone, a simple stone, start rolling down the hill. And Why aren't you reading this text? And hit that statue that was so powerful of... of of human ingenuity and power. Now, no, he isn't actually preaching the biblical text. It hasn't been read out during the service at all. He's just making reference to these things, and then, but he's not really reading these pa passages out in context. You haven't heard the story of Joseph in context. Uh, it was recently, was it last year? Um, yeah. It was, I think it was last year, it was in 2022, uh, during, you know, uh, in the lead up to, to uh, Easter uh, at the midweek services at Kongsvinger, I preached through like the practi practically the entire story of Joseph in the book of Genesis week after week. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've taught from the pulpit, read from the pulpit, the entire, like the entire story of Joseph. And the glories and kingdoms of kings and men. And that rock, that stone hit the feet, the clay feet, and it collapsed, and suddenly the king of kings. And Again, why aren't you reading this text out? The Lord of Lords said, I've brought a new kingdom to take over the world. But here's the amazing thing about this dream. All right, here's where the gaffe is going to occur. He forgot it. When <clears throat> no, Nebuchadnezzar did not forget the dream. He's going to try to justify what he's saying by quoting from the King James Version, which actually is a decent translation, by the way. Uh, really good translation of this. It actually captures something in the original that, that, our, our, that our modern translations don't quite capture. And that's how that idiom was put forward. But I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back this up. Listen again what he's saying. But here's the amazing thing about this dream. He forgot it. When he woke up, you would think something that important something that is historic and world-shaking, but he could not re recall it. He forgot it. 
And he said, the thing, that's what he called it in Daniel 2. He said, the thing has left me. So he calls his magicians and he calls his soothsayers and his fortune tellers and his witches and he calls them in. And he says, tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. I cannot bring it up. I can't remember it. I've forgotten the dream. And, the, and he said, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. I believe that a lot of people. Yeah. So the phrase in question is that it has left, the thing has left me. Okay. So let's do a little bit of work here. Okay. Did Nebuchadnezzar forget the dream? N no, not at all. And I'll prove it. Okay, so the, the text in question is here, and uh, the verse in question is verse 5, and let me pull it up with the King James, because that will, you'll see the, the phrase in question, which is actually uh, like a, almost literal word for word of how the Hebrew reads. So here's what it says, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me, okay, the thing is gone from me, and so... What Jensen Franklin is assuming, and assuming incorrectly, which shows he hasn't done his homework, is that Nebuchadnezzar, by saying the thing is gone from me, is saying that I've, I've already forgotten the dream, so you have to remind me what it is. That is not what he is saying at all. So let me show you what it says in the ESV, which then basically gives us a, a, a pretty good English uh, paraphrase of how the Hebrew works, but watch how it says it in, the, in verse 5 in the ESV. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. So the, they, the ESV translators take the Hebrew phrase and translate it, the word from me is firm, which has a totally different uh, you know, way of, of, of being understood. But let me, let me explain the Hebrew phrase in question. Okay, the word from me is firm. So the uh, the phrase in question begins here, and so this is milita, mini, and then azda. Okay, so milita, mini, azda, and what this legitimately means is the word uh, th that has that from me has departed or gone. In fact, I'll show you this using, okay, so found out something kind of interesting about Logos. I'm kind of excited about this, is that uh, a lot of my Logos resources are now available in a web version. And it, that's probably been around for a while, but I've just discovered it. So let me show you. So in my library, in Logos, and I'm doing this in, <laughs> in a web browser, not, not in any Logos software, but in the actual web browser itself. This is my library. So in my library, I happen to own the Gesenius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, okay? And there is a reference specifically to this phrase that is that we see in Daniel chapter 2. 2 verse 5. So here's the here's the reference here. So here we've got uh you know, milita mini azda, right? And so it gives the straightforward Hebrew translation without any explanation. The word has gone out from me is how you would translate it. Um especially the azda has gone out from me. And here's how this Hebrew lexicon explains it. I.e., what, uh, what I have said is ratified and will not be recalled. Okay, <laughs> so the, the idea here is, that it, it is not that Nebuchadnezzar forgot, okay? And you, it, it, the only way you would think that is by only studying the King James and then not looking at the original languages to see what is meant by it. Was, he, was Nebuchadnezzar saying, the, uh, the thing is gone from me. Does that mean that he's forgotten the dream? No. Instead, the phrase itself means that what I've said is ratified and it won't be recalled, which is why then in the... Uh, in the ESV, it translates that that three word Hebrew phrase. The word from me is firm because that's what he's that's what it means. So although it's not exactly what it says in the Hebrew, uh, the word from me has departed or gone from me. Uh, that that doesn't make any sense to our English ears. So the ESV says, all right, here's what is meant by that phrase. The word from me is firm. So let me read the story and then we'll we'll go back to. Uh, to 
Jensen Franklin. Great story, by the way. The, 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 the book of Daniel is just gold. And why any, any preacher of Jesus Christ wouldn't relish the opportunity to preach through portions of Daniel is just beyond me, because this is an absolute gem of a book. And this, this particular story is fascinating, because at this point, Nebuchadnezzar is a full-on idolater, and, uh, and yet... God is going to be revealing things to him regarding the end of the world and, and, and the second coming of Christ. It's absolutely stunning when you consider the implications. But uh, here's, what the, here's how the story reads. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now, this doesn't mean he's a dreamer. This is a, this, these are prophetic dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. And then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So, no, that's what they're supposed to do. You got to tell me what my dream was. And you'll find out why he's going to require them to tell them what his dream was. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servant the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. The Hebrew here is actually kind of graphic. Um, you shall become body parts is kind of how the Hebrew reads. <laughs> yeah, it's scary stuff here. And your houses will be like a dunghill kind of thing. So, but if you uh, but if you show the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said. Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, Well, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. Same phrase, by the way, right? That the word from me has gone out, that it's firm, okay? If you do not make, no, make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. You see, verse 9 also disproves Jensen Franklin's gaffe that Nebuchadnezzar forgot the dream. He knew exactly what the dream was, and the reason why he wasn't telling the dream to his magicians and enchanters and Chaldeans is because he knew that if he told them the dream, they would make up an interpretation. And so he he's basically saying, I will know that you are able to give me an interpretation only if you can actually tell me the dream as well. That's what he's saying here at the end of verse 9. Nebuchadnezzar knows full well what his dream was, and he's not forgotten it. They, in fact, in order for them to give the interpretation, they must first tell him without him telling them what his dream was, right? So the Chaldean answered the king, and, and they said, well, there, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except for the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. No one can accuse Nebuchadnezzar of, of being level-headed, you know, just, just like he's known to be, have, have a, a volcanic, uh, you know, uh, ang anger problem. So, so the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions in order to kill them as too, kill them too. <laughs> so, and thus perished Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, that's not how the story goes, but th that their, their lives are in danger at this point. So then Daniel replied with prudence and with discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? 
Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time so that he might show the interpretation to the king. So then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the guys who are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, that, that's, the, that's the Babylonian names. These are their Hebrew names. So, and, and he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So no, no decreeing, no declaring on the part of Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, or Hananiah. <coughs> uh-uh. Crying out to God in prayer for mercy. Spare us, good Lord, right? So then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes the kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch. So he's got, he's got the answer. He knows exactly what the dream is. And he knows its interpretation. He went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Now, Daniel's humility comes roaring out here in a beautiful way. But let, let me continue. So Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles of, from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. So the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, that's the name that Nebuchadnezzar had given, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Watch Daniel's answer. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in the bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And I would note, so, so you got the Medes and the Persians being the silver. You've got the, uh, the Greek empire that was created by Alexander the Great being the bronze one. The iron one is the Roman empire, right? Uh, and there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. 
And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. Its interpretation is sure. Legitimately, he has a prophecy regarding the second coming of Christ. It's stunning when you consider the implications. Absolutely remarkable. And we as Christians, we can read this and go, oh man, we are down in the toes already. And we can know with certainty that Christ is really close at hand. We're that far down in human history. All the details as given by God through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, those are, those are all now where we are. And so Jesus is just around the corner. Yes, he's going to establish a kingdom that will have no end in a world with no end. And all of the goofiness of the current state of affairs under these bizarre politicians that we have nowadays, that'll all be a thing of the past. And we will only have King Jesus forever and ever. Mm, come, Lord Jesus, come. Great text, right? Why? Why? Why didn't Jensen Franklin read this thing out? And why did he make such a stupid, silly gaffe, embarrassing himself, showing that he, he hasn't even rightly studied this text to preach on it correctly? Because Nebuchadnezzar definitely didn't forget the dream. He wasn't telling the dream, and he was firm that he wasn't going to tell the dream so that he knew the interpretation was sure. So let's see Nebuchadnezzar's response. So then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. He paid homage to Daniel. Wow. Really? Nebuchadnezzar paying homage to Daniel? Dude, or how, how do the kids say it nowadays? Brah, right? So, and he commanded that an offering and incense be offered to Daniel. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him rule over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Seriously, who, 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 which preacher of Christ's words would not want to preach on this text? And you'll note that if you just do a little bit of research, which requires you to know the biblical languages, which is what you should be doing if you want to be a pastor, you wouldn't be making the silly statements that, well, Jensen Franklin made. Let me back this up so we can hear this painful gaffe in context, shall we? Okay. All right. His Listening. fortune tellers and his witches, and he calls them in and he says, tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. I cannot bring it up. I can't remember it. I've forgotten the dream. Nope, that's not what he said. Again, the biblical text for pastors. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed or blushed with embarrassment, who can rightly handle the word of truth. Ugh. So he's erred here. And this is a big point. This is why he's connecting Daniel 2 with Genesis 42, because he thinks this is some deep theological point. He's got a really great spiritual point he wants to make here. Let's take a look at the point. And, the, and he said, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. I believe that a lot of people have forgotten the dream. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh, 
What dream have they forgotten, Jensen? And God needs to give a restoration of the dream to every person in this room. <laughs> what he's saying makes no sense. It has nothing to do with Genesis 42 or Daniel 2. You see, we don't just sing to sing. We don't just come to church to come to church. We don't just do what we do to do it. The only reason that we're not in heaven today, the only reason the rapture has not taken place yet is because God is still trying to get somebody else saved. Okay. He doesn't want them to be left. He doesn't want them to go to hell. I would agree that scripture says that it's not God's will that any should perish, right? Absolutely true about that. In the story of Joseph, the Bible said that Jacob, Joseph's father, loved him more than his other sons and made him a coat of favor, a coat of many colors that represented his favor on his son. And it upset the other brothers because his favor was on that boy in the form of that coat of many colors. It's the favor of God upon his children that I believe upsets hell as much as anything. The story of Joseph is a type and shadow of Christ. The coat of many colors is a stand-in for the glory of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. And it's obvious to me, we, we, we don't take any credit. We're careful to give God the glory. But I just want to proclaim that God's favor is upon this church, that God's favor is upon this place, that God's favor is upon his people. And, and what exactly do you mean by that? Upon his families that are represented. I believe that all Christians, true Christians, are, they, are, they have the favor of God, but that comes at a great cost. The death of the Son of God on the cross, who bled and died for my sins, for your sins, so that we sinners can be pardoned and forgiven and clothed in the righteousness of Christ, while Christ takes our punishment upon himself so that God's justice can be satisfied and that we can be forgiven. And yes, Christians definitely have the favor of God on their life, but what do you mean by that? ...under the sound of my voice at all of our campuses. We have a special place in the sight of God, just like Joseph did. I don't know why, but we must acknowledge. I, I, I believe in being giving God the glory and being humble, but I also, the older I get, the bolder I get. I don't have time to waste it. I believe in being humble, but... Doesn't the butt like erase the humble bit? Anymore. And I feel like saying when the favor of God is on you, you need to recognize the favor of God is on you. Not for your glory, not for your fame, not for your name, but for his name and his kingdom. That what on earth does this have to do with Genesis 42 or Daniel 2? Answer nothing. These points that he's making, even if they're true, they have nothing to do with the text that he just, well, he didn't even read them out made reference to will never end turn to somebody and say the favor of the father is here he was separated from his brothers by a coat of many colors and by the way the more that god puts his favor on you the more you stand out that's why it was a coat it was a loud coat a coat of many colors and you try to conceal. i'm not joseph you're not joseph joseph is about christ it is legitimately all about Jesus. Now, in the archives of Fighting for the Faith, I've taught on Joseph. So we'll put a link down below or maybe up here uh, so that you can go back. If you really want to do an in-depth study and see the connections between Jesus and Joseph, which are profound, then I strongly recommend that when this video is finished, go there and take a listen to that and watch that. It'll actually blow your mind. But uh, Jensen Franklin here, I, he, uh, he hasn't properly studied. He has embarrassed himself by saying some of the things that he said, and the points that he's making are not even valid to the text that he's supposedly preaching on. This is not what we're called to do as, as Christian pastors. We're to preach the word and help people to rightly understand what God's word means in context and to rightly handle these biblical texts. Jensen Franklin... I've never seen him do that yet, and I've been watching him for a long, long 
time. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to those of you who support us financially. I just legitimately cannot thank you enough. If it were not for you, we would not be able to do the work that we are doing here. So thank you for supporting us and making it possible for us to serve the body of Christ with these videos. And if you would like to support us financially, there is a link down below that'll take you to our website so that you can join our crew. And if you do so, again, thank you. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen.